chapter number 59, Surah Al-Hashr, verse number 7. Chapter number 59, Surah Al-Hashr, is the ayah that we will begin with tonight, insha'Allah. We were advertised to discuss a particular topic tonight, which was freedom of movement. However, because we have the um, fundraiser, inshallah, we'll do that tomorrow night. And tonight we will talk about the other topic that we had advertised for tomorrow. So we'll switch them. So tonight, inshallah, we will talk about how we redistribute wealth according to the Quran and Ahadith and how we build our economic principles, inshallah. So for the love of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, please have a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And for the love of the awaited savior of humanity, Imam al-Mahdi, ajjalallahu ta'ala faraj al-sharif, sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ir-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillahi alladhi hajana li hadha. وَمَا كُنَّا لِنَهْتَدِيَ لَوْلَا أَنْ هَدَانَ اللَّهِ والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام را كتاب أنزلناه إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور بإذن ربهم إلى صراط العزيز الحميد آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد أويتد سيبيو أف هيمانتي إمام المهدي عليه السلام my respected teachers, elders, brothers, and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Adhamallahu jurana wa ajurakum bi musabina, Abi Abdullah al Hussein salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh. How do we make Islam a genuine force for good in this world? Imagine if we could lift this world out of poverty. How does Islam propose to do that? If you take a step back and look at the various different economic theories that exist in the world today, none of them, none of them match the way in which Islam redistributes wealth from rich to poor, or from those who have a surplus of wealth to those who do not have. There are many different opinions. For example, people like a famous economic theorist by the name of Thomas Piketty suggested that the super rich, be they individuals or corporations, should be taxed 2.5% of their wealth above a certain amount. And he, being a phenomenal world-leading economist, argued that if we were to implement this tax, then we could remove poverty throughout the entirety of the world. Muslims immediately jumped up and down and said, look, what is zakat? Zakat is 1 40th, that's 2.5%. And therefore, Thomas Piketty is arguing for what is principally an Islamic amount. There, of course, is the most famous theories which are in the world today from things like capitalism, the idea behind capitalism, or at least the sort of throwaway line that they give you and I, they say things like they believe in, they believe in trickle-down economics. Have you heard of this term? Have you heard of trickle-down economics? 
Do you know what trickle-down economics is? The idea is that the more you invest in the super rich or the more tax breaks you give to business owners and entrepreneurs, they will in turn employ more people and so wealth will trickle down from the rich to the poor, from the business owners to the employees. And so eventually more wealth will reach those people at the bottom. Now, of course, you should know by now that this is just a means of playing you, right? In no other theory would such an idea be even contemplated. The idea of wealth trickling down from the super rich to the rest of the world and actually lives, lifts them out of poverty. Think about this. If you were dirty, you've sweated after a game of football or you've fallen in the mud, and you went into the shower to clean yourself, and you allowed the water to fall at a rate of trickling down, would that actually get you clean? Would that help you? It wouldn't. So how can wealth trickling down from super rich to the rest of the world actually help them to evade and escape poverty? Well, has it worked so far? No, since the pandemic, as an example, only the Super rich have been getting even richer, and the poor have fallen further behind. Sadly, the vast majority of Muslims and the humanitarian organizations working in the name of Islam have followed a Christian methodology of redistribution of wealth, not a Quranic vision of redistribution of wealth. I challenge you, go to any single Islamic, be it Shia or Sunni, go to any single Islamic charitable organization website, and you will see for the most part that they invite you to sponsor an orphan or a project on a monthly basis, correct? So they'll say, please donate $10 a month, $50 a month, $100 a month, and this is how you can lift people out of poverty. You'll sponsor an orphan for $25 a month, mashaAllah. This is the system that we have. And every time someone comes from an organization, whatever the organization is, it might be Al Ain, it might be Lady Fatima Trust, World Federation Aid, IUS Aid, all of these phenomenal, phenomenal organizations doing brilliant work, but you will hear exactly the same thing. Please fill in a monthly subscription form and you can donate to someone in Yemen. You can donate to someone in Iraq. You can donate to someone in Pakistan. Tell me something. Where in the world does giving someone $25 a month lift them out of poverty? When you see a homeless person standing at the side of a, a, a petrol station or a gas station and they've got a, a, you know, written a sign on a piece of cardboard. I'm hungry and hopeless, hungry and homeless. Can you donate something? You pull down the window, you pull out 20 bucks and you give it to that person. It's a good deed, isn't it? You've helped someone in need. You know that that person, inshallah, for today, will have something to be able to feed themselves with. Does it lift him out of poverty? What does it really do? How far does $20 get you or $50 get you in this world? doesn't even get you a full tank of petrol or tank, tank of gas. Yet we imagine that the way that we're supposed to lift millions of people out of poverty is by giving them a monthly subscription. This is completely incorrect. So how does Islam encourage us to redistribute wealth? The problem we have at hand is three. Number one, that we live in a deeply capitalistic and materialistic society. And so the way in which we grow up is not with Islamic ideals or an Islamic understanding of how we are supposed to utilize our wealth, but we live within a world that tells us to spend and spend and spend on the things that you don't need. So that the corporations that are advertising to you can make more money from you. This is the first problem. Second problem that we have is that we live in a world in which much of our Islamic knowledge is given to us by memes 
by giving to us by little clips, 30 second reels, 60 second reels that have to reduce ilm to clickbait, making you click on that title so that that thing gets viewed. I'll tell you an example of a, a meme that I saw on Instagram a few months back. It had more than 50,000 likes. More than 50,000 likes written by an ordinary person, an ordinary Muslim. But sometimes, you know, a person says something and it goes viral. A person says something and everyone, oh, wow, that's really good. Well, press like, press like. Someone wrote to this effect. It may not be verbatim, but to the effect of this. I pray to Allah that he makes me so rich that one day I can be a hand to feed a poor person with. MashaAllah, what a wonderful dua. You want wealth from Allah such that you can be the hand to support someone. And it got 50,000, or at least six months ago, it had 50,000 likes. Is that actually what Islam wants from us? That we have to become rich in order to be a hand, God's hand on earth to support someone. Is that the way wealth works in Islam? But the problem is, many of us, we learn our deen through social media. We imagine that because it's become famous or it's a, a, a TikTok or because it's a, a, a reel on Instagram that this has knowledge in it. This is the second problem that we have. The first one is that we live in a capitalistic society that engulfs us. The second is many of us take our knowledge from these sort of clickbaity 30 second memes. The third one is that many a time we see very rich Muslims and they themselves say things about wealth. And then again, we follow thinking that this is what Islam wants from us. Not to keep you know, swinging a dead cat, but our friend Andrew Tate, just a few days ago on the 21st of this month, tweeted something, he said, a hundred million dollars per annum, meaning that's how much he earns, apparently. A hundred million dollars per month. And then he said, it's only $273,000 a month. Get your game up. MashaAllah, how many Muslims liked it, thinking that this is what Allah wants from them. Think about this very carefully. When you weigh these sorts of statements, like this meme or this tweet, and you actually weigh it against the way in which Islam and the Prophet ﷺ describe the matters of wealth, you will see it completely at odds with one another. There's a hadith from our Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam. In which the Prophet is narrated to have said, Oh Allah, make it that I live poor and I die poor and I'm raised on the day of judgment with the poor. That's the dua of your Prophet, according to the hadith. On one side, $273,000 a month, get your game up. On the other hand, the statement of your messenger, Oh Allah, let me die poor. A guy on the internet who's just become Muslim and has a Bugatti and his own words, 12 supercars versus the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, or Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam who gave the entirety of his wealth away twice in his life. Can you see the difference? But when you follow this one and you idolize this one or you fall into the trap of thinking that's what Islam wants from you, you don't actually get to know how Islam describes the Islamic economic system, what our duties are with wealth, and how Allah wants us to redistribute wealth. And this is our topic tonight. How Islam wants us to be able to redistribute our wealth in order to genuinely lift the world out of poverty. Or, if not the world, at least your own community. And I mean that here as an example. To lift our own community. Imagine how much collective wealth we have just in Greater Vancouver as a Shia community. Just imagine for a sec. If you put it all together, the collective wealth. 
But at the same time, imagine how much poverty there is in our immediate vicinities. How is that possible? Now, there's a wonderful dua from our fourth holy Imam, Zain al Abidin, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. From Sahifa al Sajjadiyya. Now, you all know the rank, the station of Sahifa al Sajjadiyya better than I do. These words of a ma'soom in the form of a dua came to us to teach us in a way that he couldn't openly express his visions and his ideas because of the challenges, Banu Umayyah, and the way in which he was under house arrest and under threat. In dua number 30 of Sahifa al-Sajjadiyya, Imam alayhi salam says the following, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa alih, wahjubni an sarafi wal izdiyad. O oh Allah, Bless Muhammad and his household. Prevent me from extravagance and excess. وَقَوِّمْنِي بِالْبَذْلِ وَالْإِقْتِصَادِ Put me on the course of generous spending and moderation. And this is the line I want you to know. وَعَلِّمْنِي حُسْنُ التَّقْدِيرِ O oh Allah, teach me excellent redistribution of wealth. Husnat taqdeer. Teach me how to distribute wealth according to Islam. Waqbidni bilutfika anit tabdeer. Hold me back with your gentleness from the sin of squandering wealth. Now this is the dua of our fourth imam, salamullahi alayhi. But I want you to focus on this one line. Alimni husnat taqdeer. O Allah, teach me excellent distribution. That tells you that in Islam, there is a model for redistributing wealth. Capitalism says this. Socialism says this. Tatism says this, Marxism says this, and so on and so forth. I'm asking you, what is the redistribution model of your and my wealth in Islam? By show of hands, how many people have ever come across this topic in your life? One sister, anyone else? SubhanAllah, just think about that for a second. We live in a world in which every four years there's an election cycle and you have the left and the right arguing over to how to tax and redistribute wealth. No one alim in the world has come and told you what the Islamic economic system is regarding this. Can you see how far behind we are on the basics of our civilization, on how we can actually make an impact in the world today? This, inshallah, will be our topic to think about how to be able to redistribute wealth in Islam and to honor the words of our fourth holy Imam Zain al-Abideen salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi Kindly open your Qur'ans to Surah Al-Hashr chapter number 59 of the Qur'an verse number 7 This ayah is a principle. It is a vision of the way in which the Islamic economic system principally works. Everybody has the ayah? Yes? Let's read it together. We're going to need <clears throat> the second half of the ayah, but we'll read it from the beginning, inshallah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ma afa Allahu ala rasulih. من أهل القرى فلله وللرسول ولذ القربى واليتامى والمساكين وابن السبيل Whatever Allah has restored, given to his apostle صلى الله عليه وآله from the people of the towns it is for Allah, so the apostle, for the near of kin, the orphans, the needy and the wayfarer Now, 
This next part of the ayah is the kicker. It's what I want you to really focus on for a second. كَيْ لَا يَكُونَ دُولَةً بَيْنَ الْأَغْنِيَاءِ مِنْكُمْ Why is it that there are so many different categories in which wealth should be given to Allah, to his apostle, to his nearer of kin, to the orphans, to the needy, to the wayfarer? كَيْ لَا يَكُونَ دُولَةً بَيْنَ الْأَغْنِيَاءِ مِنْكُمْ Wealth is not supposed to circulate amongst the wealthy. Can you see that? Is that mentioned there? You can all see it. The Islamic starting point is wealth in Islam is prohibited from staying in one class or category of people. If you are rich and you remain that way, because you continue to gain wealth, continue to earn that high amount, and you remain within that class, anyone who is in that situation know that we are not redistributing wealth the way in which it is supposed to be. Wealth is not allowed in Islam to remain in the hands of the wealthy. That is completely different to the Western economic system. The wealth should get wealthier. The wealth should be given more tax breaks. The wealth should be able to have access to accountants that can either do tax avoidance or evasion. You know, I always forget the difference between avoidance and evasion. Thankfully, I don't have enough money to be able to, you know, whether it really matters whether I do evasion or avoidance. Some people, they can do one or the other. Maybe you'll tell me which one is the illegal one. Now, often you'll see the richer person get richer and richer and richer. If you look at this, this ayah, Allah states it is not permissible for that person. A person should not be getting richer, 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 richer. Because wealth should not circulate only amongst the rich. What happens? I'll give you an example. You have a family, a rich family, and they want to get married. Come and ask the Mawlana, whom should I get married to? The immediate answer will be, get married to someone from your equivalent background. So they go and find someone else who's super rich, and then you have two rich families marrying into each other, and inheritance of wealth goes to the next generation. Actually, from the Islamic perspective, wealth is supposed to be redistributed. And so really what should be happening is helping people out of poverty. Instead of two rich marrying each other, it should be that those two rich families marry someone else who don't have those capacities in order to lift another family out of whatever circumstance that they find themselves in. But we don't have that culture. We don't have an Islamic culture. We have a capitalistic culture that thinks about the hoarding, the keeping of wealth for ourselves, for ourselves. Whereas the Quran says wealth is not permitted to be able to circulate amongst one category of people. Khair. One of the grand scholars of the revolution, Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Hussein Beheshti, Shaheed Beheshti, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayh, was one of the leading scholars of Islamic economic theory and wrote excessive works and helped guide the early revolution in Iran on how it can structure and organize itself. And I want to be able to read to you one paragraph from his works on the statement of redistribution of wealth. And if you and I understand this, we will go so far to be able to understand how the Islamic system actually works for ourselves. This is a quote verbatim from His Eminence Shaheed Muhammad Hussein Bihishti, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala. Listen to this very carefully. Wealth in a society is like blood in the human body. Wealth in the society is like blood in the human body. As blood should be in circulation in the body, so that all organs in proportion to their need and position may use it to their advantage. Similarly, wealth should be in circulation amongst the strata of society, 
so that its members may maintain their life and be vigorous and energetic. Think about this very carefully. How many organs do you have? You have the brain, you have the heart, you have the liver, and so on and so forth. Do they all need the same amount of blood? No, they don't. They need their own amount of blood to be circulated to make that particular organ energetic, to make it work. So, the same way your blood needs to be distributed across all the organs for the organs to work, wealth is also supposed to be distributed in order for a society to work. Ayatollah Bihishti says in his statement. He continues. If blood is blocked to one organ so that it does not flow to other parts of the body in sufficient quantity, thrombosis will occur. Correct? If one part of the body doesn't have blood reach it, thrombosis will occur. And this will cause serious trouble for the rest of the body. If one of your organs doesn't receive blood, what will happen to the entirety of the body? The rest of the body will fail. It may upset the entire system or even lead to death. Similarly, if wealth is blocked to a particular class of society, many social ailments are likely to develop. As blood keeps all the organs alive and enables the whole body to function in a coordinated manner, the same is the case of wealth within a society. Without economic equilibrium, members of the society cannot make coordinated efforts which are necessary to save the society from decay and ruin. Subhanallah. Imam alayhi salam in his dua in Sahih Sajjadi said, Alimni husnat taqdeer. Teach me excellent redistribution. How wealth is supposed to be distributed Ayatollah Bahashti says, the example is like blood in your system. The same way blood has to reach everywhere, wealth has to reach everywhere. If one group goes without, and one group has, it is obvious to you what is going to happen to you in your life. Therefore, there is a proper way in which we are supposed to redistribute wealth within society, inshaAllah, for the love of the holy fourth Imam, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Now, <clears throat> our sixth holy Imam, Ja'far ibn Muhammad as Sadiq, Salawatullah wa Salamuhu says that the reason why there is a Muslim in the world that goes without is because of the lack of redistributing wealth from the rich. Now this is important. When Imam al-Sadiq uses the word wealthy or rich, he doesn't mean someone with assets, someone with a Ferrari, someone with the best horse in his time. No. The word wealthy in Islam is anyone who has a surplus. That surplus could be one cent, it can be one dollar, it can be a million dollars. This is what he means by this word, wealthy. He says, it is the fault of the wealthy that they have not given their money away as to why the poor have not received their share within society. Let me read to you the hadith from our sixth Imam alayhi salam. And we'll try to unpack it. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says the following. And this hadith is found in the book, Man la yahdaruhu al-faqih. Which you know is one of the four earliest, greatest books. From Shaykh al-Suduq, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. Islamic taxes were made as a test upon the wealthy. You remember I said wealthy doesn't mean rich. Wealthy is anyone with an excess, a surplus amount to their need. Islamic taxes were made as a test upon the wealthy as in an aid for the poor. Had the wealthy given their dues properly, they would not remain a poor, needy Muslim. And they would have become comfortable by what Allah prescribed. 
people are not impoverished, nor in need, nor hungry, nor bare of clothing, except because of the sins of the wealthy, because of the sins of the ones who have a surplus amount, but don't give it in the way of Islam. Our sixth holy Imam alayhi salam. What I want to do now, inshallah, is show you from the Quran and Ahadith exactly how the redistribution of wealth works in Islam and how we could immediately, immediately overnight lift an entire city or an entire country or an entire world out of poverty if only we were to actually know the economic theory that exists within Islam. So I'm going to ask you to open your Qur'ans and go to a number of verses. Please go to Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2. Verse 219, we'll start with this ayah. Please, I want you to note these verses down tonight, really. Screenshot them, really make a note of them in your notes section, email it to yourself, text it on your family WhatsApp group, I don't mind. But take a note of these ayat and see how Allah asks us to utilize our wealth Versus the way in which we have been brought up to think about using our wealth. Everybody has the ayah? Yes? We're going to go to the second half of the ayah. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Yes, Alunaka. Mada yunfiqoon. They ask you, Ya Rasulullah, what should they spend their wealth on? Notice the Sahaba did not say, Ya Rasulullah, how much should we spend? Why? Because the companions weren't just spending wealth. They would spend in all different ways. They would spend their time in the way of Islam. They would give away food in the way of Islam. They would give away horses and weapons in the way of Islam. It wasn't simply money in the historical sense. So the question was, Mada yunfiqun. What should we spend? Please, who can tell me what is the answer? What does it say? Qul al afwa. Do you know what al afwa is? Al afwa is your surplus wealth. Whatever is surplus to mine and your needs is what is supposed to be given away in the way of Islam. Capitalism tells you, put it into the bank account, get a good interest rate on it, save it, build it, your people will inherit it, save your money, buy a bigger house, buy a better car, buy a fancier car that you don't really need, go up and up and up and up and up and up until eventually as our friend Tate said, it's only $273,000 a day. Get your game up, bro. This is what your life is supposed to be about. The Quran said, hang on a minute, no. What are you supposed to spend in the way of Islam? Whatever is above your knees, al-afwa, is actually not yours. Now normally what I would do with you is I would give you ayat first, and then I'll give you a hadith. But just so you know that it's not my words. You might say, man, Sheikh Jafar, you know, it's good. It sounds all snazzy and stuff, but I'm not sure. So if you're not sure, I would rather you listen to the words of your master, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. And then we will go back to the ayat of the Qur'an. Just so you can hear it, that there's no doubt that this ayah, قُلِ al-af, tell them, whatever is surplus, that's what they should spend in Islam. Now, if you all know Nahj al and you know it's divided into three sections, there are the sermons, there are the letters, and then there are the sayings. Saying 192, please just note it down. Saying 192 so you can see it in your own time. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib Salamullahi alayhi says in the hadith Yabna Adam Ma kasabta fawqa qutik 
فأنت فيه خازن لغيرك. O son of Adam, whatever you earn above your own needs, you are nothing more than a treasurer of it for someone else. Pair the ayah and the hadith together. You know Ahlul Bayt only ever speak in accordance with the Quran. And if there's anything different to that, it's not really from the Ahlul Bayt Whatever is above your needs, now I'm going to work into this so you understand it, but think about your needs. If you're an individual and you're only responsible for yourself, what are your needs? If you're a husband or a father, your needs are different, right? Because you have wajib nafaqa upon you. You are obligated to look after the financial needs of your wife and children, your dependents. So for example, it might be roof over your head, it might be your bills, it might be medical insurance, it might be education, it might be savings, it might be paying for umrah, paying for a car, paying for gas, paying for, paying for, paying for. As an individual, your needs are different to being a husband and a father. But whatever you are responsible for, whatever is your needs, your duties, if you earn above that, it does not belong to you. It belongs to someone else. How many of you have ever heard this? How many of you have actually heard the Islamic theory of redistribution of wealth? Realize Islam is not capitalism. It doesn't ask you to buy a fancier car just so you and I can keep up with the Joneses. In fact, it doesn't even permit it. It's haram. Because that wealth belongs to someone else that is above your need. Now, if you need a Ferrari, bro, we can talk about it. Because maybe I need one too. But the reality is, for the majority, majority, you don't need that. Actually, a slightly lesser car would suffice. It might be a nice Lexus. It might be a good car. Whatever it is. But you know what your requirements are. Your genuine requirements for your social status. Anything above that does not belong to you. I don't need to buy a $90,000 car. The $60,000 one suffices. I don't need to buy the $60,000 one. The $30,000 car suffices. I don't need to have four pair of cleats. One pair of cleats suffices. The additional three that look good and allows me just to have different kicks with different colors and different styles. If you don't need it, that wealth does not belong to you. Not my words. I'm showing you from the Quran and Ahadith. This is not mine and your wealth. Think about this very carefully. When Allah gives to you a dollar, do you really think that it belongs to you? For the, in the first place, is it, is it really the ego that says, yeah, yeah, I earned that money? Subhanallah. No, you didn't earn that money. Allah is ar raziq He's given it to you out of His grace. And if he decides to give you more than you need, or me more than I need, then he didn't give it to me to spank on something more than I need. He gave it to me to give and distribute to someone who is in need, someone who earns less. Allah gives and he gives less. يَبْسَطُ risk. He gives lots to whom he wants. And he gives less, straightens to whom he wants. So if you've been given more and this person's been given less, anything above your need belongs, belongs to them. You are khazinun lighayr. You are nothing more than a treasurer. You are holding on to it, not so that you can buy something snazzier for mine and yourselves, but it belongs to someone else. Not my words. Words of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. Let's go back to the Qur'an, insha'Allah. Please open your Qur'ans. <clears throat> we'll run through these ayat. And I said, please screenshot them, note them down, review them in your own time. Chapter number 43, verse 32.
Surah Al-Zukhruf, ayah number 32. Remember, anything that is above your need belongs to someone else. Let's look at the ayat, see how Allah describes this issue thoroughly. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ahum yaksimun rahmat rabbik Is it they who distribute the mercy of your Lord? نَحْنُ قَسَمْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ مَعِيشَتَهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا We distribute amongst them their livelihood in this life. We are the ones who decide if you have a $60,000 job, a $100,000 job, a $30,000 a year job. وَرَفَعْنَا بَعْدَهُمْ فَوْقَ بَعْدٍ دَرَجَاتٍ We raise some people above others in degrees of what they earn. Now look at this. Why? لِيَتَّخِذَ بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضًا سُخْرِيًّا So that some of them may help others. The reason why you have been given more money is not for you to spend it on more than your needs. It is simply to help another person who is in need. If you, mashallah, have been given extra money, that is for you to be able to employ another person with, to gift it to them, to pay off their debts, to be able to give them that ease, according to the Quran. Another ayah you can open up, inshallah. If you go to chapter Surah Al Qalam, I think we took this ayah on one of the earlier nights, on the second night. Surah Al-Qalam, verse number, or chapter number 68, verse number 17. We took this ayah, but just to mention it again. Everybody's there? Yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna balawnahum kama balawna ashab al-jannah. We will try them as we tried the owners of the garden. إِذْ أَقْسَمُوا لَا يَصْرِمُنَّهَا مُصْبِحِينَ When they swore that they would certainly cut off the produce in the morning, verse number 18, وَلَا يَسْتَثْنُونَ And were not willing to set aside a portion for the poor. All of our mufassireen say that the story of this garden was that there was an owner, the father, and that he used to have a brilliant garden, beautiful garden. It used to produce fruits and vegetables. And whatever was above his need, he would distribute it to the poor. But then when he died, his two sons took over. And instead, they took that excess, that surplus amount for themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them and their garden because of it. Think about this very carefully. I told you on the previous night, Surah Al-Qalam was the second chapter of the Quran to be revealed. From the beginning of Islam, from the beginning of Islam, Allah told the earliest Meccans, if you have more wealth than you need, it needs to be spent in the way of Islam. Why? So they could purchase slaves and free them. They would become Muslim. Do you remember how early Islam was movement, how its movement was? They used to purchase those slaves and free them. They used to become Muslim, didn't they? That's how dozens and hundreds of early Muslims started. Imagine, imagine if those early Muslims had taken on my understanding of how wealth should be. My money is my money, bro. I earned it. I worked hard for this. I should live a life of comfort, ease, and luxury. I'll get a better car. I'll buy something more that I don't need. This ayah from the second chapter in the order of revelation came and said, no, early Muslims, if it is above your needs, 
belongs to someone else. You need to give it in the way of Islam. One or two more verses just to be able to show you. There's many more I could give you, but just one maybe for the sake of appreciation. Surah at tawbah chapter number 9, verse number 69. No, it's not number 69. My apologies. Uh, let's have a look. Try number 35, inshallah. Mm. No, verse 34 or 35. My apologies. Verse 34 and 35. Everybody's there? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Now, this verse is about those people who hoard wealth. So you have a surplus, and you keep it, you hoard it, you stick it in the bank, or buy things that we don't need, above our needs. What does Allah say? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Look how it starts. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu. It's addressing you and I, mu'mineen. Inna kathiran minal ahbari wal ruhbani liyakuluna amwal nas bil batil. Many of the doctors of law and the monks eat away the property of people falsely, bil batil, invalidly. وَيَصُدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ And turn people away from Allah's way. وَالَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ الذَّهَبَ وَالْفِضَّةَ وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَهَا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَبَشِّرُهُمْ بِعَذَابٍ عَلِيمٍ and as for those who hoard up gold and silver and do not spend it in the way of Allah, announce to them a painful chastisement. Person who just hoards up wealth, doesn't spend it, doesn't use it, thinking, because this is the way Islam wants you to be rich, bro. The ayah gives us a very stark warning of that outcome. I could mention many more ayat that say the same issues, but I will stop there and I'll move to one last hadith. Hadith of our sixth Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad as Sadiq, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh. Who is narrated to have said the following La yukmilul imanu billah hatta yakuna fihi arba'u khisalin. The faith of a servant of Allah is not complete unless and until they have four traits. Yahsanu khalqah, noble character. Wa yaskhi nafsa, generosity. Wa yumsiku fadl min qawlih. And spares himself from excess unnecessary speech. min malihi, and spends the surplus of his wealth. Four traits of a servant that will make his iman complete. Spending from the surplus of his wealth makes your iman complete. You know. Many, many times the examples of our Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam how much they would give away. But when they used to give away, what, what did you and I think about when they give these things away? Famous hadith of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. Famous narration, he has a shirt, and the shirt is pretty torn and pretty tattered. The, Normal practice of Ali ibn Abi Talib was that he would stitch the shirt or keep the shirt until it was really no longer usable. I'm not telling you anything new here. For Ali ibn Abi Talib to just go out and spend when he doesn't need it, you would say that's not Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's not the Mawla that you and I know. So he would fix it, sew on the button again or whatever was needed in order to fix it. Eventually, Hadith says that it becomes too tattered it's not befitting of him. He decides to go to the market. And then he buys himself a new shirt. A new shirt. 
as he's going back home, he comes across a poor man. He says, Ya Ali, I have need. I have no clothes left. I need something. Do you have something? SubhanAllah. Ali ibn Abi Talib has just worked hard to be able to save up for this shirt. He has a new shirt that he himself needs, but then he gives it away to this particular individual. SubhanAllah. In Iran, a few years back, there were floods, mass floods that devastated many of the cities. His Eminence, Grand Ayatollah Sheikh Ja'far Subhani, may Allah bless him, preserve his soul for us, grand human being. He gave away his own house to those who had their house destroyed in the floods. And said, from now I will rent. I have a house, but you don't have one. But if I'm able to have an income, which I do, I can rent. So I can have something for myself. And he gave away his own house to a family who had had their house destroyed and decimated in the floods. SubhanAllah. There are people who actually live by these principles. Now, let's do a little bit of economic work, me and you, to make sure that we understand how to implement this. I'm going to give you some basic figures and then we work into it a little bit so that everybody can understand. We're going to pick a figure for the sake of picking a figure. Let us say you earn $2,000 in a month. Just a figure. You earn $2,000 in a month. Your expenses, all of them, are 1,000. What is your excess? Thank you. I made it as simple as possible so that even the youngest can do the math. Or at least I can do the math. You earn 2,000. All your expenses are 1,000. Your excess is 1,000. Normally, before tonight's majlis, maybe, maybe, you might have thought, that additional 1,000 is for me to spend on whatever I want. I can buy a better car, I can buy a third pair of cleats, I can buy another pair of sneakers, I can buy better, I can buy Versace, I can buy Armani, because that's the culture that we live in. Now you know, according to Quran in Ahlul Bayt, that excess belongs to someone else, a project. It could be tonight, Tonight, inshallah, in a few minutes' time, we're going to have a, a phenomenal fundraiser for MYM. Whatever it is, it's a secondary subject as to where that wealth goes. I've written a whole, I've written a book on it. It was sold here, the prospering through a cost of living crisis, as to the five categories of people that actually have right over your excess wealth. It's a different lecture altogether. Inshallah, Allah allows us we can do that as well. That wealth is excess. Now think about this very carefully. I need to make sure you understand the depth of this subject. Let us say you have 2,000, 1,000 is excess. Number one, sometimes your monthly costs go up, don't they? It's not always 1,000. Sometimes you have an extra bill. Sometimes something breaks in the house. Sometimes the car breaks down. The tire goes flat. The tire bursts. You need to spend extra. So this month, you spend $1,500. Your excess is? $500. Sometimes you have no excess. There are many people, they will earn 2000 The entirety of their monthly income is gone on bills. They have to earn 3000 just to keep up pace. You're in minus by 1000 Do you have an excess? No, you don't have an excess. Therefore, you don't have anything to be able to give. Do you understand? So number one, when we say excess... Everyone's excess is going to be different, and some people are not going to have an excess, number one. Number two, when we say that first $1,000 is all your expenditure, it is literally all of your honest needs. Think about this carefully. It might be that you have the rent or the mortgage to pay. You have all the bills to pay, right? You have a legitimate saving that you need to put in. Right now, if you're renting and you want to buy a house, you have to build up a deposit, correct, in order to get a mortgage. That deposit could be 30000 50000 100000 whatever it may be. That is not excess money. That's genuinely your expenditure money. So that counts as your spending. 
Now, if all of that goes in your monthly paycheck, then so be it. Then you don't have an excess. No problem. So from my $1,000 or $2,000 that I get in the month, I have to pay my mortgage. I have to pay my bills. I have to have savings. I have to save because tomorrow I want to get married. Tomorrow I'm saving because I want to go on Umrah or I want to go on Ziyara. None of this is excess monies. All of this is what? Is your expenses. Now, let's say you have $2,000. $1,000 is on your expenses. And then you save $100 a month for a rainy day. It's possible. Many places in the world it gets hit by bad weather, whatever it may be. You need to put money away. That saving, after one year, what is taxed on it? Khums. So you still have khums. So here you can see you have your income, you have your expenditure, you have your savings, which may have khums on it, depending on what your marja's rulings are, and then you have the potential for excess. Whatever is mine in your excess, surplus, khazinun li You are nothing more than a treasurer for it or someone else. Think about this on a global scale, on a national scale, on a local scale. If people actually gave away their excess wealth, instead of spending on things that they don't need, or just sticking it in the bank and hoarding it, can you imagine how many people we could lift out of poverty immediately, overnight? This is how Islam wanted us to be a force for good in the world. To understand that our wealth is a risk from Allah. And when he tells us that this is your portion of this risk, and this might be someone else's portion of the risk, we don't ignore it. Otherwise, on the Day of Judgment, we will be asked, I gave you this amount, what did you spend it on? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us. Think about this very carefully. Imagine hoarding something that doesn't belong to you. Imagine hoarding water from the family of Ahlul Bayt and from the grandchildren and the grandsons of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa only a person who is used to hoarding, only a person who's used to stealing and taking things from others, being wretched enough to hoard something when others are in need, could end up keeping water away from the granddaughters of the Prophet If you have been born for a task, and that task is to serve Imam al Hussein, and Imam al Hussein's daughters and sons are crying out, Al Atash, Al Atash, can you imagine what you feel your duty is in that moment? You know that your master, Hussein, alayhi, cannot yet go to the battle. His is the last life to be given. This is his duty. But every minute that Hussein waits to give his life, he has to hear Ruqayya crying for water. He has to hear Azhar crying for water and for his mother's milk. It broke the heart of Hussein. If it broke the heart of Hussein, I want you to imagine the pain of Abu Fadl al Abbas in those moments. No wonder he kept going back and forth to his master. Oh, my master Hussein, I cannot bear the cries of the children from this camp any longer. Allow me to enter into the battlefield. Eventually, 
after every single one has been martyred in the way of Hussein. Abbas again comes and says, Master Hussein, now will you allow me to enter into the battlefield? All Hussein can say is, Oh Abbas, if you go into the battlefield, then where will my army be? Who will be there left to defend us? Who will be there to command my army? He looks towards Imam al Hussein. He says, Master Hussein, look at the battlefield. It is filled with the bodies. There is no one left from us. Now is my time to be able to go. When Al Abbas arises upon that horse, he is such a giant human being that his feet drag upon the ground. I want you to imagine this type of warrior entering into the battlefield. And I want you to imagine this scene for a moment. I want you to imagine Al Abbas alayhi salam arriving at the banks of the river Euphrates. I want you to imagine him placing that water into the flask. And I want you to imagine a four year old Ruqayya watching on from the edge of the tents. I want you to imagine that she sees the flag of Abbas go down and then start to come back from the banks of the river Euphrates, start to ride back towards the tents. I want you to imagine the glimmer of hope in Ruqayya's heart. I want you to imagine what Hussein is feeling, seeing that flag rushing back towards the tents, hoping that a drop of water might reach the lips of Ruqayya and Azgha and Muhammad al-Baqir and his sister Zainab and Umm Kulthum and his family. And then I want you to imagine Ruqayya running into the tents and saying, Children, do not worry. I see my uncle Abbas coming back. I see the flag returning. It will only be a few more moments and then he will bring water for you. And then I want you to imagine that she goes out and she does not see that flag any longer. I want you to imagine that she rushes to her father. She grabs him by the legs. Father, where is the flag of Abbas? I had promised my brothers and sisters the water would be coming. I do not care for the water. Tell me what has befallen my uncle Abbas. How could Hussein describe this moment? His arms having been severed, 4,000 arrows being shot at him, hitting him in the eye. One of the khutaba says that I recited the maqtal of Abu Fadl, and that night I went to sleep. I saw Fatima al Zahra in my dream. She came to me and said, Oh Sayyid, you recited the maqtal of my son Abbas. My son, huh? You recited the maqtal of my son Abbas but you did not describe the harshest moment the most difficult moment for Abbas the Sayyid said oh Fatima al Zahra I described that his arms were severed she said that was not the most difficult moment I recited that the water bag was pierced she said that I did not re I recited that the water bag was pierced she said this was not the most difficult moment for my son Abbas, then tell me, O Fatima alayhi salam, what was the most difficult moment for Abbas? She said, every martyr that fell from the horse, when they fell, they had their arms to break their fall. My son Abbas did not have any arms. He fell face first onto the burning plains of Karbala. There was an arrow in his eye, and this went further into his skull. Wa Abbasah.